Well, just a quick introduction. My name is Eric Schilling, and I am the Director of Educational Technology here at Caldwell Academy. I've served in a lot of different roles in my time here. So this is my sixth year at Caldwell, and I've done everything from classroom teacher to teacher of STEM and developing the program that Julie Strang is teaching right now in, in STEM. I have been the high school principal, I've been the assistant principal, and now I serve in this role as Director of Educational Technology. So it's a really unique opportunity here at Caldwell that we have to be able to teach your students and your kids through a classical pedagogy, but also through a biblical worldview lens. And I love the fact that we can talk about God in our classrooms. We can be able to pray over them when they're struggling, but also be able to work with parents like you all in our community aspect and talk about what does Bark look like and how do, you, how do we as a school help support you guys in navigating the world of technology. One other plug I'll give just real quick is this idea of access. You can see here at the bottom. And this is something that the school is providing free to you all as parents. It's a great resource. If you're already signed up for this, I believe the cultural translator came out in an email this morning. I see some of your heads nodding. This is a great thing for you if you're wondering, like, what, does, what is this word that my kids are using? What does it actually mean? And there's a phrase that actually is in this morning's article that talks about out of pocket. Now, I know what out of pocket means, which means unaccessible, right? They're off campus. They're, out of, they're not going to be available because they're in meetings all day. But out of pocket is, actually has a totally different meaning with your kids. And this is just like a little quick snippet about access and the, the availability of what's provided there. And that really kind of means like they're out of line. So I did not know that until this morning. And I love technology, and I do a lot of reading within technology. So Access is a great resource for you all as parents. If you're not already signed up for the Cultural Translator, I would really encourage that. Again, it's free. If you're interested in how to get connected, you can always contact me. My contact information is here. If you are interested in, in getting my contact information, you might already have it. And you can also look it up on the website, but you can also scan this QR code and it'll download a contact card for you with my phone number here on campus, my email address, our website, everything that you might need to get in contact with me if you have any questions. All right, so we're going to cover a number of things today, and my goal is not to overwhelm you, but to provide you with some really great resources as you walk out today, right? My background is in teaching, and so I love to be able to say to my students as I'm teaching them, I don't want you to walk in with an, a lack of an understanding and walk out with a lack of understanding. You might think to yourself, man, that was a lot of information, but at least you have some places to start, to start reading and to start discovering what's out there and what's available for you as parents. So we're going to go through three things today. One is just kind of introduction, background on technology, really kind of the internet and where it started and where we are now. We'll work into kind of getting started. What does it look like to actually log into Bark, to set up your kid's account, to make sure that you have access to what you need. And we'll talk through the paid components and the free components of what Bark can provide. The majority of what we'll spend today is in the resources section. And there are a lot of resources out there, particularly around Bark. But there's even more stuff out there about Life360. Some of you may use that app that tracks your kids. You can look at their location, text messages. It also tracks their speed. So if they go over a certain speed when they start driving, it'll send you a notification and say, hey, Johnny's going over 70 miles an hour. Right? This is great when your kids start driving. Okay? There are a lot of articles out there that talk about the importance of parents and their role in technology. And then there's the child's perspective, and they say, well, they, I feel like they're invading my privacy. They're invading my space, and I don't want them to know everything that's going on. And so we're going to talk in just a second about what it looked like as you and I were growing up, and then what it looks like with our kids and them growing up. So how do we get here, and what is Bark, and how can it help? So let's start back in 1993, the good old days. Before mainstream internet really was even available, I think about myself as a kid, my parents told me often, you gotta just go outside and play, right? So I had friends, I had Legos, I maybe had some action figures, and I did a lot of that. Very limited screen time. If we had a screen, it was one, it was in the living room, and it was, you know, on a good day, we had more than eight channels. Eventually we got cable, and that was like, I mean, my world was rocked when we got cable, and we had like 30 channels. Now I think there's like 750 channels. So mainstream internet really came about in 1993. Most of us in this room probably didn't see internet in our homes until the late 90s, right? AOL started sending those disks in the mail. I remember as a kid, I used to look forward to getting those in the mail because I got another 40 free hours and a new instant message name. MSN was around, right? You're laughing and you're resonating with this because you remember those AOL disks, the whole like, welcome, you have mail, right? So that was there. But that was like late 90s as we're moving into this idea of internet in the home. And even when we had internet in the home, it really was very limited. 
it was limited to instant messaging on a really basic level and you had to know your friend's screen name or your person's screen name. You had to know the person's email address. You couldn't look it up on a website to find out what it was. And it was really there for sending emails. You really couldn't browse the web very well or if you did, it took forever to be able to get to the sites that you wanted to. And the sites were just slowly developing. There wasn't a lot out there. And so this is kind of mid to late 90s this is coming about. We fast forward to 2005 and 3G internet access comes available. And so I'm transitioning now to kind of the mobile environment of internet access. And I remember when 3G internet came out, I was reading an article about it and I thought, I cannot wait until I have a phone in my hands that can actually get onto the internet and it doesn't take forever to be able to access a website. Fast forward to 2007, I remember standing in line June of 2007, getting the very first iPhone that came out. And that was super exciting and just, I was enthralled with that but it was actually on 2G connection. It wasn't even on the 3G internet that was available back in 2005. And so it was so slow. I remember trying to get GPS directions and I would like, you'd miss a turn and it's rerouting and you'd have to pull over and wait for it to reroute. And then you could, you know, two minutes later you could start your journey again because it couldn't keep up with the pace. Eventually they came out with an iPhone 3G and then eventually in 2009, 4G internet is announced. And that is where most of our phones have lived up until the last year or so is on 4G LTE, right? Much faster internet, we can actually watch Netflix, we can download movies, we can download apps, and we have pretty easy access to internet and to data on our phones right in front of us. And this is the world that our kids are growing up in. Most recently in 2019, the standard became 5G internet, which you probably, if you watched the Super Bowl, you saw a number of ads for AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. They're all competing for your business right now, trying to get you onto their 5G spectrum. One, it's cheaper for them. Two, they've invested billions of dollars into this new spectrum. And three, it is a lot faster. If you have a newer phone and you have access to 5G internet, I just got an upgrade of an iPhone 13, and I was amazed. I'm sitting downtown, my kids were at a park downtown, and looking at the internet speeds down there, I was hitting 500 megabytes a second. Now some of you might think, I don't know, is that fast or not? Just kind of keep in mind, when we started back in 1993 with home internet at 56K, and now we're at 500 megabytes and 5G internet really can hit a gig down. That's what our school has is a one gigabyte line and our phones can now do the exact same thing. So I share all that just in context to say, look how far we've come from when mainstream internet was introduced in 1993 to where we are now in 2022 and the ease of access that our kids have in the palm of their hands, right? We see this in the business world as a great tool I see this as a parent as, oh man, how do I navigate this and train my kids in the right way to navigate what's in their hand, right? These phones are way more powerful than any computer that you or I grew up with really until probably the early to mid 2000s. So the question is, what is it like as a teen? They have access to this, right? Easy access to the internet, easy access in the palm of their hand. What's it like as a teen? So I'm not trying to be the Debbie Downer here, but I want to give you perspective on what our kids have to navigate in this social media world and the phones that are in their hands or any devices. If your kids are not quite there yet, it means that these numbers might shift in the next few years. All right, this data is directly from Google from the 2020 annual report on children and technology. And so my hope is that the numbers stay here and don't get any worse, but I want you to at least have a perspective about what your students have to navigate as they're coming into this digital world and they're navigating this with the phones that are in their hands. So almost 67% of our students will be influenced or be involved in some sort of conversation around self-harm or suicide. Whether it's through a family member, whether it's through a friend, that's probably more likely where it's gonna come from. They will have to navigate and try to talk friends off the ledge. They'll have to try and figure out how to be a psychologist or a therapist at the age of 12 or 13 or 14 with a phone in their hands. 66.3% will deal with some sort of Ill, mental illness, not themselves necessarily, but have to navigate that conversation, whether they see it on social media because somebody has posted something and then they reach out to them and respond, or whether their friend reaches out and says, hey, I'm really struggling with depression. 87.9% will deal with some sort of sexual content or sexting. So if you don't know what sexting is, I'm not trying to mansplain here, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about defined terms. That's an important thing in classical education is defining our terms. That is where you're sending nude or very pro provocative images or messages, text messages back and forth with another individual. And so almost 88% of our students will have to navigate in that in some form. That doesn't mean that your child is the one sending those photos or sending those messages, but it means that somebody is asking for them from them, 
right? They're sending the message saying, will you please send, us, send me a photo? Will you please send me a message back and forth? And so just being aware that our students have to navigate that. 94.1% will deal with some sort of interaction of violence, whether it's physical violence uh, that they've seen on campus and then they're talking about it via text message, whether it's saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. 91.1% will deal with some sort of drugs or alcohol, whether it's being asked if they have access to it, whether they are asked if they want to participate, right? This, and this continues into college as well. And 82% will have to deal with some sort of cyberbullying. Either they are aware that cyberbullying is occurring, they are participating in it, meaning they are the cyberbully, or they are on the receiving end of cyberbullying. And so I share that as just kind of a, hey, let's understand as a, as a room where, what our students have to navigate and how we as parents need to be aware of the different situations that they're going to have to walk through. So my goal is not to end on our Debbie Downer, but to talk about the resources that can come with that. So we're going to get there in just a second. So the question is, is what is Bark and how can it help? All right, Bark detects messages containing cyberbullying, sexting, signs of depression, suicidal thoughts, and many others without you as a parent having to spend hours reading your child's messages. So just imagine that you have to navigate all of your social media, all of your email accounts, all of your phone numbers and the text messages and the WhatsApp and the everything else you have that you're messaging with friends and family, and you've got to synthesize all of that data. And then now you've got multiple kids with phones and access to an iPad, and you've got to navigate all of their data as well. To me, as a parent, that sounds completely overwhelming, and this is where Bark comes in and they can help. Right? They have algorithms that go through and will sort through the different messages that your students receive and that they send to make sure that one, that they're appropriate, and if two, if they're not, they'll notify you. And so Bark is a great tool for that. So the question is, how do we start with that? How do we make sure that we have Bark set up, and what's the difference between our free and our paid accounts? So the free account is what's provided by the school, right? This is part of our agreement with Google Education, with the apps that we use here on campus, with Gmail, with Google Drive, with Docs, with Slides. Anything that is linked to your child's Caldwell Academy account is monitored, and anything that is inappropriate is flagged for you. They have an algorithm that flags it. They will send you an email, and we're going to talk about how to get that set up, make sure you have access to that account. There are a number of things that are not covered. And so anything that is on a personal email address, anything for text messages, so a personal phone number, anything within social media or those video apps, if they're watching YouTube, if they're on Facebook, which let's be honest, our kids probably are not on Facebook, but they are on Instagram, they're on TikTok. So that is part of the paid service, and that is $99 annually. This is not a sales pitch. I'm not trying to convince you to say, hey, listen, if you will sign up for this, we as a school get money. That's not the case. I'm trying to explain to you what's available. What does the free account do? It's only for the school account. What's the paid account take care of? If you're interested, there's a 20% off code here called Tech Night. And if you use that in your sign up, it will take 20% off your order. Again, we get nothing as a school. This is not a Mr. Schilling is trying to convince you to, to do this. Caldwell gets a kickback. This is me trying to help you save money as parents because I recognize that this is an ex extra expense. One of the great things about this is that this covers any kid in your home. So you're not paying $99 per child. You're paying $99 as a family, and you can add an unlimited number of accounts and devices to that account. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're deciding. It'll also help you filter web content, it'll block websites, it does location tracking, and you can also schedule screen time. So if you're thinking, hey, listen, I want to give them a reward, I can schedule it, they have free time on their screens, great. If you want to lock it down at bedtime and make sure they can't have access to anything on their screens, you can do that as well. All right, so there's some limitations with the free, but it does monitor all the school accounts, so kind of keep that in mind. One last thing I'll mention just before I go past this, some, I see some of you taking pictures, which is great. You're welcome to. I will also happily send you this slide deck at the end, and it has all this information along with a number of links for the resources that we're going to talk about today. All right, so we're going to do a quick activity. And so what I want you to do with your phones, if you have it with you, if you don't, there's no judgment, but if you have a phone with you, you can either scan this QR code or you can go to pollev.com forward slash Eric Schilling 636. So either one is fine. If you do a QR code with your camera, you can tap on that, and it should take you to a poll. I'll leave it up for just a second. There are three questions. All right, we're going to just, and this is anonymous. It does say if you want to type in your name, you're welcome to. I'm not asking for that. 
but I would just skip it. I'm looking for just anonymous information here about where you are as a family, what access your kids have to devices, where the devices are stored, and do you already have a monitoring app available? Everybody get the code? Pollev.com forward slash Eric Schilling 636. Okay, so there's three questions. Once you submit for the first question, there should be a little next button at the top and you can go to the second question. We don't have anybody that's going to give their kid a phone after ninth grade. Your, your kids will be happy about that. Right? The, and this, please understand, I'm not doing this as a judgment. I'm doing this so that we can understand as a group here and as a community that we are all in different boats. We're all in different stages. I think about my oldest, and as I'm raising her, there's certain things that I do with my oldest that as I look up my third, I'm like, there's no way I have time for that, right? I mean, it's just not feasible. And I talked to a parent just the other day, and you know, their kids, they always got them when they went into eighth grade, and now their youngest, their third, had to get one in sixth grade because he's traveling on the baseball team, and they don't have enough cars and enough parents, there's only two of them, to get around with the other kids to drop them off, and they want to know where their child is. They want to be in contact with them. So they changed their boundary, which was eighth grade, to sixth grade, so that they could actually get a hold of their kid and their kid could get a hold of them when they needed to. So this is not a judgment. This is so that you all as parents recognize and can see that there, we are, have a wide range of when kids are gonna be getting devices here in this room, right? There's no right or wrong way to do this. My challenge to you as parents is to be aware of what you're handing your child. And we always made the joke when I was a kid, right? As soon as I got keys to the car, that's like the most dangerous thing that they, my parents could hand me. I would say nowadays, while cars are still very dangerous, I would argue that phones are much more dangerous than cars are, right? And they do things so quickly and in a fleet of a moment, they send a message, they post something, and they can't ever get it back. And we say words to one another, right, in person, and we might hurt somebody's feelings, but we can go back and repair that relationship, and there's no recording of what is out there. With social media, with text messages, it's out there, and these kids forget that they can't get that back. They can't go back and just erase it. So having that conversation with your kid is a really important component to this. So here's where we are in terms of getting devices, kind of a split between fourth, fifth grade, eighth and ninth grade, and then the majority here at sixth and seventh grade getting a device. All right, our next question is, where is my child's device stored at night? Right, 32% say in their bedroom, 9% say in parents' bedrooms. 41% in the kitchen slash living room, kind of a common area. And then right now, they do not have a device yet, 18%. All right, again, across the board, we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a second. And then our, current, our family currently uses software similar to Bark to monitor our child's digital habits. We've got almost, uh, not quite half saying yes, 55% saying no. I would have said 10 years ago, as an educator and a person who loves technology, I would have said, listen, I can manage this. I don't need to pay an extra service to be able to monitor what my kids are doing online. And nowadays, especially with what I see just kind of coming through our Bark server, I have no problem paying $100 a year to make sure that my kids are monitored and that I can't filter all of that, that somebody else is gonna help partner with me on that. So again, not a plug for you to buy Bark if Life360 is a better fit for you, or there's another monitoring service. I know that Disney also offers one out there. It's called Circle. Um, they also offer a great service. So the question is, you've heard all the information about what your kids have to navigate. You've learned a little bit about how to access this in Bark, how to filter to see what they're actually seeing, what sorts of flags are coming about. The question is, as parents, what resources are there? Where do we start and what's out there? So this is just seven different things that I've put together that are resources for you all. If you get a copy of this slide deck, each of these with, that's underlined is linked and it will take you to a PDF document that Google has already put together to walk through conversation starters, questions to ask your kids. All of this information is linked right here. So I'm happy to share this with you. If you don't get a chance to take a picture at the end of the QR code and submit your email address, you can always just email me directly and I'm happy to share this with you. We can even link it in Eagle's call so you have access to it that way. All right, so we're gonna go through a, a few of these. I'm not gonna go through every one of them. The Google Drive, school issued Gmail accounts, internet access, these three I'm gonna skip by today because this is stuff that is monitored by the school. But I wanna talk about this child parent tech contract just real quick. 
So the age-old saying when I was a kid was this. Anything after midnight, or anything that happens after midnight is never good. You've probably heard this phrase before, right? That is actually shifting with our, our kids' generation, right? And I would argue that anything after 10 p.m. is not good. What's happening with, in my house around 10 p.m. is I'm getting tired. I want to go to bed. The older I get, the sooner I want to be in bed, right? The other night I was in bed at like 8.35, and it felt so great, right? My kids still go to bed earlier than that, so it was literally we got our third down, and Betsy and I looked at each other, and we're like man, this is exciting. We're going to bed. And then we woke up the next morning at six and we were like, we got like 10 hours of sleep. This was great, right? So as adults, we're excited about sleep. I know our kids are not. And so at 10 p.m., what happens is their brains are starting to kick into overdrive. So maybe they're still finishing homework if they're a little bit older. But if they have a device, what's happening is the social site is coming alive, right? Their friends group is saying, hey, I finished all my homework. Hey, what did you do today? What did you get on that test? You? And they start texting. And then the longer they text, the less they can go through kind of the mundane pieces that happen throughout the day. And they're having to navigate now. Well, hey, this person said this to me. Or did you hear that this person broke up? Hey, I asked this girl if she likes me and she didn't respond. What do you think that means? And so after 10 p.m., what's happening is our kids are getting into this new routine and they have easy access to their friends. Social media, social media influencers, and I think about myself as a kid, if I wanted to contact a friend or a girlfriend at the time and I wanted to call them, I had to call on a landline. There was one line in my house and my mom or dad may or may not pick up the phone at any time. With cell phones, that doesn't happen, right? We're not gonna drop in and be like, hey, put that on speaker, I wanna listen to what's happening here. And so they're trying to navigate the world around them in a very different way than you or I had to deal with. So my challenge to you all as parents and again, this isn't a judgment, but it's an encouragement from what I see on the back end of the bark filtering is if you don't already have in place two things, one, a tech contract with your kids, if they already have a device, I would encourage you to do that. In that link, there's a link to a sample tech resource, a sample tech contract that you can draw up with your kids and, so, and set expectations and boundaries. I know as adults, it works really well for me when I understand what my boundaries are and I understand the expectations placed on me, it's much easier to operate within that versus just kind of walking in and going, I don't quite know what to do, but there's a lot of expectations on me that I'm unaware of. That's really hard to navigate. And our kids are in the exact same boat. So setting a tech contract with them about the expectations of when they, when they can and can't use their device, it might even be, hey, when mom calls or when dad calls and you're out of friends and you don't pick up on that first call, this is the consequence that comes with this, right? We want to have easy access to our kids. We as parents are paying for this device. This is why we've gotten this for you, is so we can access, have access to you. The other thing I would really challenge and encourage you to think about, if you don't already do this, is to not let their device be in their room. The living room, the kitchen, your bedroom, some place that's not their bedroom. I think about myself as an adult even, right? I've got my phone set up to go onto focus mode. I don't know if anybody does that, the DND. At 10 p.m., it clicks off. I don't care what kind of email comes through or text message, I'm not gonna see it unless you're in one of my six favorite people in the world. If you call, it's gonna ring through, right? If you don't know how to set that up, it is a game changer in terms of getting sleep throughout the night. You don't get notifications at two o'clock in the morning. Our kids won't turn that on because they wanna make sure that they know the information as soon as it possibly comes available and so they're going to make sure that they're checking that phone at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to see if that girl they like or that boy they like texted them back. And so in order to help them establish healthy boundaries, I would really challenge you all as parents to move that device out of reach of them, put it in the family room, the living room, the kitchen, or your bedroom, and just say, hey, listen, you'll get it back tomorrow at 7 a.m. It's not the end of the world. Nothing's going to occur between 10 and 7 that you can't navigate when you wake up tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So just something to think about and consider. One of the other resources talks about cyberbullying, and this is a component or just kind of a snippet from the PDF that Google has put together. There's three things I want to just talk about because cyberbullying is so dangerous and toxic in our society today. We see this happening on social media, right? We post a picture and then what happens? You get multiple trolls that come on and they start to nag and pick at the person. They put a post about a political view, a body image, right? They, they do body shaming. There's so much that happens online and kids feel like they can hide, and adults feel this way as well, that they can hide behind the anonymity of technology. They can change their username so you'll never know who it is. And so 
Common types of cyberbullying that are out there are harassment, cyberstalking, catfishing, and trolling. If you don't know what those mean, catfishing, again, I'm not trying to mansplain here, but I want to make sure we're defining terms. This is where you're acting like you're somebody you're not, trying to gain or pull somebody else in, right? Kind of this idea of phishing. So I pretend like I'm a peer that goes to school with them. I send them a message on Instagram. They then friend me. I now have access to all their pictures and I can see what's going on in their life. And I'm almost a 40 year old man. That's a really, really creepy thing to think about. And so your kids, whether they know it or not, are being catfished by people out there if they're on social media because there are people that see their profiles that are out there online and they want access. So my challenge to you all as parents is even if you do nothing else today, talk with your kids about making sure their profiles are not set to public. Make sure that their profiles, if they have any social media, or if they're getting social media, that they are set as private accounts and they have to accept those that would request access. More kids have been cyberbullied on Instagram than any other platform. So we've got 42%. Again, this is information from Google. And Instagram's a really unique component. It's a part of Facebook, you probably know this, or part of Meta, which is the new company name. It, is, it has an algorithm that runs and determines the child's or the, the user's gender and will post photos on their timeline, not on their timeline, but on their feed as they're looking through that are relevant to their gender, their age, and what they have paused on even for half a second at any other time they've scrolled. So as a man, you can imagine what comes across my feed, and I'm thinking, I love the DIY stuff. I talk about this with my wife. We're, we both love TikTok. Don't judge me. Right? So we love the, the DIY stuff on TikTok. She has dogs and animals on her TikTok. And then all of a sudden, both of us will get these random things that pop onto our feed, and we're like, like, where did this come from? Like, we didn't like this. We're not following this person, but they have an algorithm that's built into these social media components that are trying to feed us based on our gender and our age. The last piece I want to talk about is this, which is the victims may suffer in silence for fear that adults will restrict digital access if they speak up. And this is going to go to a component I'll talk about in just a bit, which is the role that you all as parents play. You, believe it or not, are actually the number one resource that we have. And so encouraging your kids to have that safe conversation with you without the repercussions of losing their device is, a, is going to go a long way. It's actually going to be the most important component to making sure your kids have a successful time with technology and social media. All right, so there's another resource called Barkomatic. So whoever came up with this name I think is a genius because it just sounds really cool. But what it does is it analyzes every device that you have in your home, every social media site that you allow in your home, every streaming service you have in your home, what types of Chromebooks or computers or Mac devices or anything, what even internet service you have, and it tells you how to set up every single one of those. So I'm going to show you this. I ran this for my house because I was curious what the resource would look like and I thought, I don't know if this is going to be any good. It first off, it pops up with a technology contract as kind of a sample that you can work from. It gives you some pointers to talk about with your kids for online safety. It even gives you a one week trial of the Bark Premium. Again, I'm not trying to pitch that to you, but it does give you seven days free. And then it talks about learning about the top five social media apps. So it's a good place to start. What it does after that is it gives me a list of every device and app that I have added to the system that I say, yes, we as a family use and we have access to. And then it shows me in detail, way more detail than I expected, how to set up every single one of those devices. You can't see all of this here, but it talks about photo privacy. It talks about family sharing. It talks about creating a family account. It talks about setting screen time limits. And this is just for the iPhone 11. So if I scroll down, content and privacy restrictions, how to monitor content, and then it brings up all the different apps that I might have access to or my kids might have access to. So if I went to TikTok, as I mentioned before, it talks about how to set up the safety concerns, how to set up family pairing so I can actually see the TikTok videos that my kids are viewing. If they have a TikTok account and I have one, I can link those together. How to set up screen time management within that, the restricted mode, how to make sure it's set up as a private account, like I mentioned before. And this again is just for TikTok. And you can see as I scroll here is it shows you even the video game systems or the video games that they might be playing, right? My boys love to play Roblox. 
but I have it limited so they cannot access the chat feature on Roblox because that's where catfishing comes in and a lot of inappropriate content comes through Roblox while they're just playing the game and jumping around as these little people, right? It's kind of fun to watch, but then the chat comes through and I'm like, these kids cannot be eight years old that are playing because of the content that they're discussing, right? So it talks about how to set up parental controls for Roblox. It shows me how to set up filters on my home internet. If you have Spectrum or North State or AT&T, and then it shows me how to restrict access even within my streaming services. So this could be a great resource for you if you're thinking, I have all these things and I don't even know where to start. You can actually use this. You can go through the Barcomatic. It'll let you put in all the pieces you have and it'll walk you through how to set up each and every one of those devices, apps, and streaming services. All right, we are almost finished. My goal is to finish by nine, so we'll see if I'm a good teacher or a bad teacher. So with social media, there are a number of pieces to kind of keep in mind here, and these are just kind of some specific apps to talk about with your kids. Maybe they are already using these and you're not aware. The top four, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and Reddit. If you've not heard of Reddit, it's a great site if you're looking for answers on like how to rebuild an engine in a car. They'll walk you through things like that if you want to know what's the newest tech. I mean, they have everything on Reddit. Um, I've been using that for years, but there's a lot of inappropriate content that's out there. There's an acronym NSFF, if you've not heard of that. So NSF, sorry, NSFW stands for not safe for work. What that means is, is pornography, right? That's the kind of the hashtag for pornography. That's the hidden word for it. So it doesn't get flagged on servers at companies. And so they have a lot of content on Reddit that is particularly for that sort of uh, demographic or that sort of um, filter. The ones I want you to be aware of as parents are these Vault apps down at the bottom. If your kid has an Android app, whether it's a tablet or a phone, there's something called Vaulty, and it is specifically designed to hide content. It keeps videos and pictures inaccessible to others, and it also takes a picture of whoever tries to log in. So if you're a parent and you're like, oh, I wonder what's in this app, and you press the button, it snaps a picture of your face as you're trying to log into it. Calculator looks like a calculator, but it's not a calculator, in case you're wondering. Okay, so you have a calculator app that's built in. You also have this one, which is meant to hide photos and videos from prying eyes. And so these are rated as 17 plus on the app store for the calculator, but the Vaulty, if your kid has an Android device, it is set for all ages. If it's set for, I have a filter on my iPad at home and it's four plus, that app would be able to be downloaded by my kids without me having to approve it as a parent. So these are just two quick ones to be aware of. The other one I want to talk about are the anonymous apps, and the one particular I want to mention is Omegle. If you've not heard of Omegle, it's a, a neat concept. I use neat very loosely. It is basically a chat roulette app where you press a button, it spins a wheel, I pop up on the screen, you pop up on the screen, we've never met each other, and we say, hey, what do we want to talk about? Do we want to talk together? Mm, no, spin the wheel again, and it rolls the dice again for the next person to pop up. Now you can imagine the type of content that is there when randomly some person pops up on your screen and even if you hit that chat roulette button again and it spins it, for that one second that you were available or that they were available, you may have seen something that you didn't want to see. So if your kids have access to Omegle, I would encourage you to have a conversation with them. So this is not me telling you what to do as parents, but to at least be aware of that's what the purpose of the app is. All right, to wrap, as I mentioned before, the biggest resource that our kids have is you. They're gonna go to friends, they're gonna go to social media influencers, unfortunately. They're gonna go to teachers and pastors to seek advice, to ask questions, but the biggest resource in this room and that's available in the world is for you all as parents, right? To have those conversations with your kids. And so my challenge to you all as parents as you step out today is to create a safe environment for your kids to talk about what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, what they're noticing, and it may not be something that happens overnight. It might be like, you know, you sit down, you talk, and the first response you get is, Mom, oh, I don't want to talk about this with you. Well, that's okay. We'll come back tomorrow, and we'll talk about the same thing, and we'll ask similar questions, and we'll ask it in a different way, and we'll make sure they understand that it's a non-threatening environment, that there's no repercussions that come with this. But when your kids feel safe with you, 
they're willing to open up about things that they're not willing to talk about with any of these other people because they're those kind of deep down dark places and they're thinking, I don't know if I'm supposed to feel this way. I don't know what to do with this information, right? And sometimes it'll be something that happened two or three months ago and then you finally get a breakthrough and they share with you and you go, you've been carrying this for three months? I had no idea. So my challenge to you all as parents is to create that safe environment with your kids. I know there are a number of counselors out there that'll actually work with you as parents in terms of how to navigate those conversations with your kids, how to set up appropriate boundaries for your kids so that they know that you love them, but you're not there as kind of the thought police and you're trying to take over their entire life on their device. And they'll work with you about how to establish those emotional boundaries with your kids, helping to create safety for your kids so they feel like they can share with you. I've seen this many times throughout my time in education. This is my 17th year in education. And kids will often come home and give you all as parents the worst side of themselves. And I just want to say, if that's happening in your house, you're doing a good job. And I know that sounds strange, but what that means is that they feel the safest with you, which is why they're willing to let their complete guard down and be these people that were like, why don't you, you don't act like that when I go out? Well, they're holding it together for the, the rest of the world. But if they're acting in their worst self around you, it means you as parents are creating a safe environment for them and allowing for them to express their emotions in a really healthy way. And so I would challenge you to continue that, to embrace that, not saying it's easy, right? I'm walking through that now as a parent, but to know that you're doing a good job and you're doing the right thing. So I know that that is a lot of information and we didn't even go through all of the different resources that are out there, but if you would like a copy of this slide deck, there is a link right here with this QR code. You can take a picture of this as you leave today and it'll just ask you one quick question which will say, what's your email address? It'll give me a list of that. I'll drop all of that into one email. I'll send you a copy of this slide deck probably with a couple other links to go along with it as well. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those right now kind of for the good of the group or if you have individual questions you want to ask me after, I'm happy to hang around. I don't have anything next this morning. So any questions kind of for the good of the group? We'll start here in the front, and then we'll move to the back. So, Sarah Beth? That is correct. Yeah, I mean, I would say... You're exactly right. We are handing over, if we, especially if we pay for that premium service and we hand over their text message or their phone numbers and they're getting all that data, they have a, a list of all the privacy components that they look at that the data is protected. You're right. We are kind of helping them create an algorithm around our kids and what they're searching and so they can either tailor advertisements to them or not. My thought as a parent as an, and as an educator is I'm willing to give up a little bit of freedom and a little bit of privacy in order to create a safer environment for my kids. But that's not how everybody's going to feel about that. So that's really something as an individual or as a parent that you would have to kind of take into mind. That's a great question. I can look into that and see. I don't know the answer off the top of my head on that. That's a great question in terms of how to set privacy settings within Bark in terms of what they can and can't have access to. That's a good question do with that information. Yeah, I'm happy to look. That's a great question. Is there a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I'm an Apple user as well. I mean, I have a Mac here. I have everything Apple. So I've got an Apple Watch. I've got the Apple phone. I've got, I mean, and to me, the ecosystem just works well together, which is why we went that route. It's just kind of, it pairs well together. Everything syncs. Um, I have found that it's very easy for me to manage the screen time components through the Apple built-in app, but that's not a paid service. With Bark, I know that Bark is always working to make sure they integrate well with uh, iPhone users and iPads because it is the number one smartphone that's out there. It's the number one operating system that's out there for mobile devices. So they want to make sure it's easier access with that. So they're working in conjunction with Apple to make sure that those can pair well. I also know that Life360 is another great app that does a lot of what Bark does 
it's an, again a paid service and I know that, that works very well with the Apple ecosystem so that might be something you would look into if if you set up bark and even try the seven-day trial and you go that didn't work as well as I want there's ways around it I might try life 360 as another option other questions Ashley do you have a question Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, a really tough topic to answer because I think it'll be different for every kid and every family. Ultimately, though, when they leave the house, you know, she'll turn 18, she'll graduate, and she's not under your roof. And she's staying in a dormitory. And my, my guess, I'm speculating here, is you're not going to have her turn your phone in to you and then say, go back to the dorm. And she might be three, six, eight hours away. Hopefully she's not that, too, that far away. But ultimately, our goal as parents is to train our kids so that when they are out on their own, they can make good decisions. Um, my philosophy is that I want to have as much control over what my daughter has access to for as long as I possibly can, but knowing that there is a time where I've got to start to unleash a little bit so that she can start to make her own decisions. I think a lot of that comes back to the you component of the resources, which is having those conversations with her. So when you and your husband feel like you're in a really good place with her with the relationship and she's open and sharing with you, and that you're seeing her make some really good choices around technology, around social media, and you're saying, great, we've monitored this until you were 17. We're, you're doing a really great job with this, commending her and saying, hey, hon, we're going to take off this and this and this component to help her be able to move into that you know, more freedom, being able to operate on her own. I think that's going to be different for every kid. So there might be one of your kids, you say, at 16, you're ready. And the next one, you're like, hey, until you're 25, I'm going to have this app on your phone. So I think it really comes down to each kid. That's a good question. I think it's a great opportunity to kind of move in that direction. Gab Wireless. Does app. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you're talking about, I think if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly about Gab Wireless, it's a service provider that allows them to do text messaging, calling, but limits the apps that would be on the device they have and doesn't allow them to have internet access necessarily unless there's like a very small restricted component of it, right? So if you can have that, if you can find that for your service provider, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, I think that's a great way to transition a child from no phone at all to kind of saying, hey, you have a little bit of freedom with this, you can make phone calls, you can you know, do text messages, but you don't have the full gamut of what's out there in the tech world. I think that's a great opportunity to start to transition our kids with that. So it might be that you're saying, I'm gonna get my kid a full phone at eighth grade, but you might start Gab Wireless or some other component like that in fifth or sixth grade because they're traveling for AAU or they're on a travel soccer team and you wanna have access to them. I think those are great opportunities. So that's a, thank you so much for mentioning that. Other questions? All right, well, I'm happy to stay around and chat more. My hope is that this is at least getting you started and moving in the right direction, but the biggest thing I really want to remind you is have those conversations with your kids. You are the best resource that is available that's out there. Thanks so much for coming today.